Room 1320, 1319, 15, 13, 15, 12 on 3, 4. Room 1318, 13, 17, 15, 13, 15, 12 on 5, 6. Continue dancing on 21. Rooms 7, 20, 8, 19, 9, 18, 10, 17, 11, 16, 12, 15, 13, 14. Dance on and 6, 7, and 8, and 5, 6. What was the brief? What did uh, the target ask you guys to achieve? What did they come to you with, and what was the, how did you get started? Um, <clears throat> so it's kind of like a year ago, Target came to us with this insane brief. And they came to us, and so, so myself and Tom were in the, um, we call it experiential agency, and we had experiential group at Mother. And essentially it's anything that uses the media. And, um, um. Uh, oh. So, um, we kind of get the good briefs because they're the ones that are off the radar of the regular um, mainline agencies at the time. And um, they kind of fill us with the money as they kind of let's see what they're going to do there. Um, and this particular brief was, was, was kind of awesome. They came to us, this was essentially the, the brief in itself. Create a big buzz generating fashion event idea to launch spring 2010 fashion for Target. Um, this, is, this is as big as that. I mean, like internally, they had hung on to this fashion show they had done maybe four or five years ago, which was the vertical fashion show. It was a big um, stunt uh, in New York where they had people walking up and down the side of a building. Um, it was a fashion show straight up, straight down. And internally, people had held on to that in Target as you know, a level of excellence. Um, so they said, you kind of got to beat that. If we're going to make this, it's going to be better than that. Um, had to excite, surprise the fashion industry, which is a super, super cynical um, industry. I mean, we had to talk to fashion's um, influencers and writers and press. And uh, these are the guys that have kind of seen them seen this like some of the queen shows with the butterflies and they, they've seen it. So what can you show them that's essentially going to put Target and fashion in the same sentence when they come to write their next column just before fashion week as well. Um, and uh, it was essentially about really you know creating a moment for Target's underbrands. This was just a Target fashion moment, you know. Um, for these guys, the new fashion event. So tell me, I, I want to know, was this, did you guys just come up with this right off the bat, or was it a version of something? Did it, did it sort of, you know, change, did it, did it evolve, or did it, was it, this is it? I'm, I'm going to grab a couple things, because otherwise I want to say it's the whole night. <laughs> <laughs> not, not to sleep here. It's fun, isn't it? It's all night. Um, well, it was kind of interesting because they gave us the brief and we gave it to about seven or eight 
teams, which is what we had at the moment, or had in those days. Um, and all the teams came up with five or six huge variety of ideas, mm -hmm. crazy ideas. And then we all got in a room and edited it down, and Raven Brennan, hands up Raven Brennan, <laughs> and John and Christine, not here, <laughs> um, all came up with this one idea. Um, that team had one idea, that team had one idea, it's actually the same idea, which occasionally happens. Um, and then we edited it down to, like, I think, five really amazing ideas that we took to target. Um, and they bought this one, but I think it's kind of interesting. But, I, mean, I think the point is that we went back with this incredible brief, and this is like the dream brief for any creative. I mean, it's, we're not going back and saying, look, you're going to tell the whole story in 30 seconds of a, a TV spot. Or, this is the brief, and here's a single page ad that go. Anything you want, like whatever you can think of, whatever excites you, and it's really a kind of way of releasing these creatives that have been making TV spots or print spots for so long and working within this genre and saying, look, it's not about that, it's just about pure communication, anything. And I think sometimes for me when the box is that big, I'm sort of like, I don't know where to go, so this mm -hmm. is awesome that they could actually come up with something this creative and yeah, we'll talk about how you actually made it come to life, mm -hmm. which is, you know, that's huge. But what, when, you, when you bring something like this to Target, you, you have that first meeting, what happens? What, how does Target react? What scares them? Because I, I just, I know from, and you bring them something like this and they, they've never, they can't imagine it. So how do you bring it to life for them in the meeting? So, what is the meeting like? So as Tom said, we, we, we broke it down to about five ideas that we all kind of fought over. And it's great seeing people really fighting for the ideas that they really believe in. But we've got it down to five ideas and um, you know, we're pretty, loose around, do we know how to do it? No, but we can work it out, you know, and, and, and okay, sum it up in a uh, two-page piece, and this is what we took back to Tara, this is the actual, so you can see the date, this is, we went back in the end of January, we had about like three weeks of creative um, thoughts, and this was the first round of the, uh, of the creative presentation, so this is kind of like buckets of ideas, this is general um, the general idea that went over all of them was the, the overall umbrella idea was that um, it needed to be a piece of performance art rather than necessarily a fashion show. Um, but the idea that uh, wasn't our favourite, I suppose, but was the stand spectacular. So it's about setting it up and creating a bit of drama and simplifying the idea down to the point where you can write it on one step on one page. And I think this kind of sums it up. I mean, you've just seen exactly what. It's all kind of in here. Um, if you were to summarize it in a paragraph, this would be it. Um, which, is, which is kind of cool. Particularly important, though, was the fact that it, it was the standard hotel. There were some interesting anecdotes that were coming out about what was going on in the windows of the standard hotel at the time. And so there was a sort of nice little sort of backstory to it. And the standard is sort of the epitome of kind of cool and style and stuff like that and we'll get into it later on but um, it, it wouldn't really have worked I don't think if it was somewhere else. Um, so that was And something that's kind of important about what Mother has is that, so we have kind of like four main areas. We have an advertising team, we have a, a design team that's very based in fashion design and product design and graphic design, but has a, a really sort of solid base in understanding the fashion business itself. And we have the experiential team, and what our, our main skill set is that we take weird shit like this and we know how to make it, or we have a Rolodex with what used to be called a Rolodex of, of amazing people that we can bring together, and, and they can help us actually take the weirdness. And, Presented to a client, actually, no, we can actually do this. We do know how to do it. It's not just a sort of pipe dream that doesn't work on whatever level. And then we have a production company in house as well, so we know how to make films about this stuff as well. So we have sort of like different areas covered that perhaps a, a normal advertising agent 
I just wouldn't have. And I think hats off to Target because I so, think exactly. it's, I mean, it's an insane leap of faith. It's um, unbelievable to, 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 to trust your agency uh, that much and to sort of sign off and say, yes, we'll make this. I have no idea how you're going to do it. But that's let's, let's go that's exactly, exactly what happened. So they came back to us a couple of days after the, the actual initial presentation where we in fact showed five ideas and five great ideas. And uh, this was one of them. And uh, you know, I hope you would have been more pleased to have made any of them. But they came back and said, hey, you know what? This is the one. You know, this is the one we're going to take up the chain at uh, at Target. And I think part of the uh, the beauty of this idea is that it was so simple to articulate. If you were stood in the elevator at at, at uh, Target and somebody asked you what you were doing, I oh, was working on this idea of bringing the staff to tell to life in a live fashion. We got it immediately. Um, and so it rose up the chain very very quickly and. Uh, <coughs> Up to a kind of uh, senior management level, and uh, we found ourselves back in that room within a matter of weeks, asking the, the, the actual questions that were important. That right? Because uh, honestly, it's a great idea. How are you going to do it? That's my next. You know, how do you bring something like like this to life after you sold it, and they're expecting a certain thing? And you know, John Haggerty always says it's eighty percent idea and eighty percent execution. And it really, in this mm -hmm. case, is so true. Um, well, I did, not, so to yeah. Hegarty's point, like, he was probably talking about a team here. And yeah. <laughs> we're, we're, we're probably 30, 70 yeah. in what we do. The idea is great, but God, to bring the, 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 the a hotel to life, it's a great idea how we're going to do it. And actually, it was, it was Tom's part which took us to the next stage, which was finding the partners. Uh, to do this. Um, do you want to talk about the first bit when we first met them? Dexter? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, my, my, wife, my wife said you must meet this girl Dexter. Uh, and she works for Epoch and Bang On. Uh, and um, I sat down with Dexter. And I'm, I'm, again, I'm not from an advertising background. I'm from a kind of like make things background. And, um, that came in and she's like talking about her mate uh, Sam Spiegel and uh, her mate Sir Ryan Heffington who's his choreographer and stuff like that and we're sitting there talking and this was before we actually got the brief and won the business and all that kind of stuff and then I'm like, Dexter, get Dexter on the phone and uh, we flew out to LA and I'm like, I know this guy, I, don't, I know nothing about dance and <laughs> um, it's not true <laughs> No, I'm a really terrible dancer. And um, went out there and just sort of met these guys and you kind of get the vibe. And like, again, it's kind of about passion and love. And, and, and you see these guys and Ryan said nothing for like the first two meetings we met him. And Sam didn't say much either. But the next bit in terms of target was going back there and, and, and giving them something to, 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 to grasp a hold of that meant that they would trust us that we could do this. Right. And, and, and it was about, it was about, it was about generating enthusiasm right. and energy in target in order to get to the next level, which is essentially signing of money. I always felt that with advertising agencies, it was really weird that, oh, you come up with a bit of an idea, and then you give it to a production company to make it. And I was like, what the fuck's that all about? Like, <laughs> I've always made my own shit, and it's really important. And when you hand something off to something, there's a loss of translation. And, and we, we sat with a production company, we actually had like five or six production companies pitched on this yeah. business, and I'm just like, they're not really getting it, and I appreciate where they're coming from, I just don't get it. And I was kind of, why do we need a production company? And here's like, because you need a director. And actually that is absolutely key, and having legs come in and direct and create an art and sort of create a narrative, and, because that was the big thing, we're showing lots of colours on the screen, but like, what story are we going to tell? And it's funny, I'm going to ramble a bit, but I went, and I was, you know, Armin Tobin, who's got an amazing, well, he's made this amazing film of this sort of DJ show that he's put together, he's out in Brooklyn the last three nights, and last week. And it's a great concept of laser projection onto blocks, and Armin sort of sitting in the middle, DJing, stuff like that. 
And I went, and I saw the video and I was like, this is fucking brilliant. I'm like, really excited about going to the show. We bought 10 tickets for $90 each to go to the show. And got to the show and it was like, okay, so the lights and music, lights and music, lights and music. But there was no narrative, there was nothing to it. I'm like, God, you really miss the whole point. And he's just a Oh, I am. Sorry about that. You're showing shit. Um, but the idea was brilliant. And what was fantastic for me was when I suddenly realised what the director does and what the Georgie and, and, and Jeremy did for us by creating a story out of colours. Because we do have a budget and there are realities to what that means. And um, so we knew we could probably stretch the 20 minutes. Um, and we realised that we needed to have themes that we could control, that we didn't necessarily reflect back on what the target needed. It needs to be brought up in a fashion scope that it allowed each of the different fashion partners to play a certain role. Um, and so Trump was what we landed on. Incredibly broad, allowed us amazing like, uh, creative depth. But um, we split that 20 minutes up into five different acts that were arranged in a four or five minutes each. And each act we split up into a card and we started that. It's just like five minutes at a time. And let's start super lo-fi. And the first thing we did, we put mood boards together for each of the acts. So the last act was kaleidoscopic, um, which was all the cards suddenly come together in flash one. Um, but created, I think, the most exciting uh, mood boards. So this is what we took the time. This is going to be your last act. This is the last five minutes will look like this. <laughs> <laughs> so all of these, picture in your head, target, um, this being the last five minutes. And um, we are so lucky to have a client that is able to take this enormous leap of faith and say, Okay, we don't really understand the um, thing you need to do. Um, from there, we then um, I'm not sure how this works. Um, we then create these kind of um, frame by frame exactly how the lights would light up each room. So this for instance is that scene after the red scene where it goes into green and there's the lightning. So um, we went out to play and worked with George and Jeremy at legs, and we put all of this piece of paper up in the world and we put it out. What we thought was every single one of these uh, stages, like, like block by block, uh, light by light. And we created this, which is kind of like a storyboard of the entire thing. So, you know, I actually didn't know the constraints, essentially, of the technology. Because Bionic, at this stage, was still waiting for a narrative that they could bring to life. They didn't. They were kind of parallel pathing the um, the technical issues. Um, but at that stage, we had, you know, had to kind of infinite uh, budget. Um, so real quick. So so Target says, "I'm signing. Here you go. Here's the initial whatever. Yep. Go hire all these people." Yeah. Now, do you guys all work together to do all of this, or so does a, everybody do their own thing? So there's a lot of parallel parking, right. but there needs to be this narrative, this thematic right. narrative that everybody can start working to. Um, and it has to start with the lighting and the storytelling visually, and then evolve into the music and the dance. But you, you asked a question just about why we went from projections to something else and what that was. Um, we didn't quite know what anything was going to cost us this point apart from what the room cost at the standard hotel and um, there was a lot of really great light mapping stuff going on and there was some amazing shit that we were kind of digging up and we kind of thought that was a way to go and then when we actually really looked at the costs of it um, it was kind of prohibitive what we could do and what you see is actually really simple it's just fucking huge amount of LEDs, like 42,000 LED it was, just a, it was like a reality check about, you know, seven weeks out. We had to sit down with everybody and say, look, you know, we've had these insane ideas where we've all been like aiming for the moon. Let's rein it in. You know, we don't have, we, we, we have to be budget conscious. 
And so um, we had to go back to analog, and we, it had to become all LED lighting and not projection. And uh, in fact, the, the, the dancers went from a dancer in every single room with 66 dancers. Uh, uh, covering, covering everything. Okay. So tell us all about rehearsal. What happens when everything's working, you guys have some of these pieces. How long does rehearsal go on, and, and what happens? We've had all these kind of disparate factions all around LA and in New York. Um, we've been going to and fro with some of legs, and the guys have all been going back to the boards. Um, two weeks out, everybody came to New York. And uh, it, was, it was amazing. Like, everybody had been so freaking out about the whole situation that the amount of work was just mind-boggling. Um, we've been casting here um, with Ryan's assistants for dancers and we found the most incredible dancers, most of whom were going straight from rehearsals to The Lion King or Mary Poppins. And they all had like double jobs. Um, the, the, the dance rehearsal was the most crucial thing at the stage. Two weeks out, nobody had done the steps, you know, they didn't even know each other, and we had, uh, we had 66 dancers that had to cover 175 rooms, so each dancer would have a completely unique performance. Every dancer would have a list of dance steps and dance notes that would take them from one room from one act, out of that room, up the stairs, and we had to divide off the stairs for upcoming and downcoming, and they'd have to go from the 14th floor to the 11th floor in 25 seconds where they would have a tub in the bathroom that would have a different outfit that they'd have to change into in 7 seconds and you hit their mark in the window on the beat. So these guys had some serious rehearsals. The other thing is they didn't have anywhere to rehearse. Like we, don't, we didn't have a, a hotel with 177 rooms for us. It all had to be done flat. And the reality was that they couldn't see each other when they were in the hotel, so they had no visual cues. So I'm guessing 66 dancers for 127 rooms because of money. Because yeah, of money. yeah. There, there, there's, there's reality checks, you know, and um, the budget was amazing. And they could do it as well. That was a, like, I didn't know anything about dance. I like more into action sports and motorsports and shit like that. And I have so much respect for dancers now. These kids are so tough and so strong. And we had a lot of, with that setup of the six window you saw in the back of the film, we have a lot of them hit their toes, hit their heads against the windows. And these kids carry amazing injuries. And I'm like, but I love the story you told when we were on the phone the other day. You said, a lot of the dancers, they had choreographed without any walls, so when they got into the rooms, some of the moves they couldn't do. So well, let's talk about the day, the live, what happened Sorry, with the well, day. I missed that oh. piece of this, because oh. one, one, of the, one of the kind of crucial stages, just before people, everybody came to New York, is that we all looked around the room with mother, and we sold it all the way through Target as the Fashion spectacular at the stand. We looked around the room and we were like, well, you know, who's spoken to the price of the stand? Has anybody actually asked them whether this is going to be possible? And, uh, and I thought you know, had, he thought he had, you thought he had, nobody had actually spoken to the guys at the stand. <laughs> so we, were, we had this amazing idea that we had, you know, a lot of money behind it and we invested in it. And we didn't actually have a hotel at this stage. And, um, Actually, it's, it's a huge credit on the stand that uh, we went to speak to them and they jumped straight in at first. They're like, you know, whatever you want. I don't think they really understood what we were asking of them. <laughs> <laughs> All they saw was that we were going to take every room at the stage. They were like, yeah, so that. But I think, yeah, we want to hardwire, we want to send wires down every level of stairs. And yeah, whatever. <laughs> they were incredible. and. Um, it was, a, it was a huge stroke of luck, and that was our luck cashing that they got on board and, and made this possible. Um, sorry, what was the question? I have no idea. I thought they were one of the first partners. I no, they, they, were, they were one of the last partners. <laughs> um, amazingly. Um, but, oh, sorry, this is kind of insane for me. Um, 
The other thing is costume. I mean, we, we, the whole thing was about fashion. Fashion was the point of this. Um, like I said, every dancer had to run out of their room from, from the red section up maybe two flights of stairs. We actually had two guys that had an elevator waiting for them. They went from uh, floor four up to floor 14 in an elevator and had somebody in there in the elevator waiting for them to dress them because they had to have a completely change, complete change of outfit. Um, it was a massive logistical issue. We had this guy, uh, Mel Ottenberg, who was a stylist, who we dumped this on. We said, look, Mel, you know, everybody's going to have to do four changes in 20 minutes whilst running up and down the stairs. And he just wrote it. And this is a little. So, what was the date? What, what date did this happen? Do you remember the date? Sorry. No. It was in the yeah, 18th of August. Okay. And um, the crazy thing is we could get the standard entirely booked out. Every single room of the south facade, there were people on the north facade still staying there um, uh, for two nights. So we had one night that we could rehearse. And um, it was the first time we'd seen any of this. Everything was theoretical up until this point. Yet we were only 20 hours away from actually go time. So we put each of these, I think, 50 LEDs across. We had however many rooms across and however many rooms high, so we plotted out like it was a, an actual TV screen. Um, and essentially, pretend it was a TV screen. But in our heads, this is how we thought it would work. Um, there we go. We had, we had 350 radios on site day of the show, and not everyone had a radio at the time. But the, but the whole performance had been plotted out in quick time that you'd seen in that computer rendering before. So we had total uh, faith that this was going to work, but from that computer rendering that we thought had plotted out the fact that you know the light was going to be at X level at X time, and um, we only had one chance, one night, to, to plot this out. Problem is, the lighting guys were essentially fighting for time against the, um, the dancers, who were fighting for time against the legs who really needed to see the entire narrative played out. And um, we ended up getting in there late because sound had to be plugged into every single floor. And um, it was it was insane. It was insanity, and it was it's a testament to the producers. And it's the difference, I think, between the producers that work for us and the producers that essentially make a TV spot, that they can create a live performance like this that is so beautifully choreographed. Choreography in the dance is one thing. Choreography of getting guys in and out to, to, to install lighting, to like, practice the dance, to practice the sound, is just How amazing. many agency producers were involved? Three, four, maybe. Uh, we, we, so we had we we uh, had three hundred uh, radio sets, radio mics on site. I said three fifty. Three fifty, and they're all gone, <laughs> all gone, every single one of them. Everybody was mic'd up, and uh, it was insane. You know, people but you know what? There wasn't one single shouty moment. Yeah. That no one yeah. lost their shit. The whole thing. So what happened? What went wrong? So, day of the rehearsal. so we set up day of rehearsal. We set up and up to, like I said, up until that point, it was all theoretical. And uh, I was in the, the pub underneath the stand um, at about seven o'clock at night, just as it started to get dark, and uh, the first lights started to show in the building, and it was it was incredible. It worked. Like you could see that the lights were going to work, and uh, it was. Mind blowing. As it got darker and darker, we started doing various different lighting um, run throughs, and we started to realize that the lighting actually was way too complex for the building to take on. And I'd say probably 50% of our narrative was going to have to be scrapped and redone that night. Um, so we jumped out of those rooms at uh, I think 9 o'clock. Ten o'clock once we'd seen the run through, we realized it wasn't work. The guys went back, legs worked like crazy to plug in new bits of narrative, which also meant new dance sequences. The dancers had to go in and practice the sequences they knew 
We then went back about 12 o'clock that night, rehearsed new lighting sequences. Those lighting sequences were then rehearsed in the dance world. Um, by six in the morning, we had gone back and forth with the lighting and dance so many times that everybody was just exhausted. But we'd not at that point seen an entire run through. We'd seen sections, but never seen it work. And realised at this stage, we're not going to see it work before the time when we press the button, we've got 5,000 people on the ground, and we have to actually go. So I walked home in tears, I lived very near there, and walked home in floods of tears, thinking that this was the end of everything, and that it was going to be a massive disaster. I think, you know, we all know that when you get on the set, everything changes. Nothing goes the way things want to go. But in your case, it's on a gigantic scale with a lot of people, you know, waiting to see what And then you're going to do it live. Because maybe, you know, everything goes wrong on the set. So you've got to really see plenty of feet. So you guys, it seems like you guys did it. So what happens when you hit play? There's 5,000 people on the bleachers. So we closed off two, two blocks. Um, and uh, there are people on the ground, there are people on the high line, and um, we had like, a radio broadcast radioing the, the soundtrack to people that weren't you know, in proximity, but we had 60,000k of sound. Is that right? Is that right? It sounds impressive. It sounds about right. Um, and uh, and uh, we still hadn't seen it go all the way through, and uh, but there was just no getting out of it. Yet. Bleachers with target VIPs, they had a red carpet with most of um, you know, HBO celebrities and, and such, um, gossip kind of people that were apparently very popular. And um, yeah, it was, it was, we had to press play and uh, a lot of faith. About two minutes before go time, somebody called that the sound had gone out on two of the floors, and we just had to run through it. And, that was just one of those things. And um, those dancers had to just go off kind of instant, which is just how they possibly get involved with that is insane. Um, but uh, yeah, we pressed go and it all worked out. You know? It was very funny because well, I wasn't very funny, I was shaking my pants at the time. Because, uh, I'd gone to bed and left peers to his devices at about five o'clock in the morning. And where they change some of the music, and there's a bit where we go from red to kaleidoscopic, where the, the music just breaks down. And goes, I've never heard it before. And what happens when all well, that happens? Because it's like on a quick time, and then the lights slip, or the music gets ahead of the lights, and then you're kind of like. So I heard this going off during the show, and Piers looked at me with a beaming fucking grin on his face, and, like, <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, get up. <laughs> That's crazy. So what? So the, the thing is, so 5,000 people come. I know Target wants a billion people to see this. So what's what? What? What do you tell them? How do you sell? What do you say to them that hey, listen, this is how we're gonna get eyeballs? Because as we all know, nowadays the word eyeballs and the, the you know people you know, find it just how are you gonna get people to see this? It, it, it was really funny that. Like, they asked that we get people to tune in, so they, they really wanted this to be a live streaming broadcast. Primarily, I think, so that their staff in Minneapolis could see this thing live and direct. Um, and I'm like, it, it just come after the World Cup, and, and the World Cup is sort of broadcast live and direct. Lots of people tune in, it's the World Cup. This isn't World Cup, it's just some kind of weird thing that we don't even know what it is. Um, so it's kind of, I don't know about doing live streaming of events like this, I don't know if it's really, really worth it unless it's an incredible event and everyone knows what it is. So, so, but we did it because they wanted to do it. We kind of felt that it was super important because we worked with Paulson Stevens, a PR agency, and they did a tremendous job of getting some sort of media around this. We knew we had a lot of media there, and it was super important that we made this sort of beautiful film very shortly, very quickly thereafter, that we could get out in to the general sort of masses. And so obviously it was playing live on Facebook. Yeah, but I mean, there's no there's no guarantee that people are going to watch anything. I mean, every time we, 
we do a job and we take great pride in them doing it all twice really. I mean, part of what we do is about reinventing the wheel every time, which is not just the, the creative wheel, but the production wheel, which is why there's sort of risk involved. Um, but we can't go to a client and say, hey, here's a case study of what something that's been done very similar before, it will get X million views on, on Facebook. It just doesn't happen. I mean, this is completely new. The only thing that we can do to guarantee that it's going to be a success is to make it awesome. And like, for us to really believe in it, and we know that if we fight and we care about it enough, it's going to be good. You know, and everybody's like emotionally involved. It's, it's, it's going to be good. It's I something I, we truly, truly believe in and love. I've had clients ask me, well, will this go viral? Oh, <laughs> yeah. oh exactly. Yeah. Right. for like CPMs, and like cost per million, it's like, well, this is fucking bullshit. Um, <laughs> but you, I'm sure you have to have some sort of, you know, some sort of plan. No, we just told us fucking bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> no, we have a bit of a plan, and, and of course, you know, I mean, you are amazing, they're not that amazing. Yeah, you had to shoot it, obviously you yeah. were shooting it, you were shooting it. There wasn't a media line behind us to tell people to get on, other than a wild posting campaign. We set up these wild posters all around town. It was, it was essentially local. And um, I became particularly militant to the point of actually losing the client um, about <laughs> nobody finding out about it. So we were working with PR agencies who wanted to tell the world about what we were about to do. But the problem was, this was, this was like an amazing wonderful thing that once you told people what it was, it wasn't anything. You had to keep it to yourself and surprise. I mean, everything we do is about surprising the life of the time. And uh, that's the only thing we've got on our side. So teasing it was was the, the key. And then after the fact, of course, you had a really great yeah. second unit shot it, so you had a great piece that you could then show to everybody. Do you obviously plan for that? Right, and then the bloggers cover it, and then people connect to the focus sphere and there's some dark magic that happens. Yeah. It is critical to capture it in the most beautiful way possible right. because that becomes your product after. Right, right, right. Um, but you know there's there's capturing bits of it to begin with before we've done it, releasing enough of the story that would just like captivate people's imagination, but without saying too much. And we we had this like Facebook campaign. Target has like six zillion people on Facebook. Um, that followed him. And so we started this Facebook campaign where we started like leaking little bits of what we were doing. It, make sure that when you say you're going to do something, you have a production team around you. When I say around you, I mean sitting in the same <laughs> office, not at some, whatever they call production company. Um, and go into it with a spirit where you know, as I said, it was such a lovely project. Don't think we really fell out with him and me. We didn't talk for about two weeks. We've gotten about some towards here. We're eating cheese over there. I was wondering, we didn't talk for about two weeks at one point. Right in the middle of production. <laughs> <laughs> um, but once I let Liz do what he wanted to do, everything was fine. Um, but no, it, 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 honestly, it's just about sort of really having that. As a, gen a gentle confidence and understanding the team and trusting and loving your team. And what would you have, you wish you had done with it? I mean, I know it worked out, but, but it there was, away. There was something that we wanted to do, um, which was to digitally be able to focus in on a single room. And because Mel often got the stylist, created all these amazing different looks. And so we had, I don't know how many different looks we created in the end. And we just felt it was great that we got all that effort, but actually when you see the film, you don't really see the look. And we would have loved it if you could have watched the film and then gone to a room, picked a look, and bought the look for $110 or whatever it was. Cause it was you know, our, biggest, our biggest problem, like, generally, as a, as a group, is integration. You know, we can be so much more powerful if we are, if we are integrated in the general messaging plan. If there is a media buy that is um, is planned out annually around the um, events and the events tied into that, and everything works in this beautiful symmetry, it it's so effective and essentially a lot more um, efficient. 
we don't often, I mean, the nature of these huge companies is that they don't get the opportunity to be able to do that because they're so segmented themselves, but um, that would be ideal. Because then we could have said we sold 106,000 clothes out of this. We don't know what the efficacy was in terms of sales, but it would have been brilliant if we had that digital setup. And, the, and they set up on an Amazon system and it's just too complicated for them to even get their heads around. Right. Well, I think you did plenty. <laughs> so I guess I have, I think I have all my answers, uh, my questions.